sing a black girl's song. Bring her out to know herself, to know you. But sing her rhythms. Karen, struggling, hard times. Bring her out to know herself. This afternoon, we're going to sing a black girl's song, which is to say, we're going to sing a black woman's song. I'd like to begin by asking you a question that has been posed to a number of the brothers and sisters who have been gracious enough to come and be a part of uh, the Wadley conversation. I know that you travel extensively. Um, uh, I know that you are, for want of a better way to say it, a, a Renaissance woman. In your travels, um, one of the questions that comes to my mind is, that, and as I said before, I, I posed it to um, some of the other people who've, um, who've been here, has to do with um, the state of, of black people in this country. And I was wondering, as you've traveled um, throughout this, this country and uh, in, uh, throughout New York uh, City, how do you assess the present state of, of, of black people, and particularly, uh, how do you assess what's happening to black people in Harlem? Well, first of all, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the higher force, the creator, for giving me the strength, the wisdom, and the opportunity to be with you. And I hope that this is a very enlightening and enriching exchange. And I'm hoping to learn as much about those who are seated before me as I share some of my experiences. Uh, the question that you've asked is a very tall one. Um, and it might take a few sessions at Wadley, but I'll try to address it the best that I can. Um, I see that we, as people of African descent, are in a constant state of evolution, you know, changing, adapting. Um, as we know, our history uh, began in a very royal way because we come from richness. We come from a background of kings and queens. Uh, very often, the history, as reported, started us off as being people enslaved. Um, that experience, uh, nonetheless, uh, is something that we have to reference because it's a place from which we have sprung but don't have to become stuck. Um, unfortunately, some mindsets are still shackled and may not be stepping up to the plate, as it were, um, to address some of the issues that affect us. Um, their education, economics, uh, they have to do with, uh, to some degree, the breaking down of family structures, uh, creating interesting opportunities for young people to apply that tremendous amount of energy that they have. I think um, we have to go from what we know, and what we know comes out of the richness of our cultural background, and we have to return to those traditions. Uh, doing the kinds of things and practicing the kinds of customs that have made us grand. I don't think that uh, technology needs to be an excuse for not knowing a recipe that's been passed down from your grandmama's mama's mama's mama, or not letting yourself be limited to um, the latest lyric and not remembering a proverb or an old saying that might have been passed on. You know, my, my passion for folklore and uh, our old tradition is, is, is always up front for me. When we speak about conditions, as I said, it's a very tall order. And I think um, skin privilege has kept us out of some opportunities, but again, that needn't be an excuse for not trying. Um, it shouldn't be an excuse for not um, seizing whatever opportunities that might be available to us as a people. Um, as relates to our community uh, specifically, there are a lot of changes. Uh, we see some development. Um, to some degree, it's welcomed. Um, I hope it's not at the expense uh, of the many people who have made Harlem's signature. Um, and I know that that discussion is one that's uh, also on the lips of many. Um, I think we have an obligation to pass on to the young people a legacy of truth. Um, a legacy of being able to know how to do things and to be confident in that ability to do things. And they're the ones that are going to be receiving the baton from me and others. So I hope that there are, um, they have to start modeling themselves. We can't um, expect them to 
be greater than the sum total of what we're leaving them with so we can't blame the young people but i'm looking to them i hope that there's some brightness on the other side but i know that um there will be some more struggle and probably uh, folks may making a lot of noise about the disproportionate way in which the pie is being sliced that's a pretty long answer i know but yes but i think <laughs> it's one that was quite clear and one that was timely and necessary if you had to determine which of the myriad issues that affect us, if you had to look at those issues and pick a few that were most salient in your mind, um, which ones do you think are, are most in need of attention? When I think of what's happening to the Harlems of this country, and when I think about what's happening to black people, and in particular black women, with the um, epidemic of AIDS in, in our community, the fact that black women are disproportionately impoverished in single parent uh, situations, uh, the fact that there is a significant rise in the population of black women in the prisons, those things are, are, are quite distressing. And in the conversations that we have with our brothers and sisters here in, in, in the community, uh, oftentimes those conversations are, are, are broached, but we don't have enough time to really talk about them and to digest them and to try and make some sense of them. So what I'm asking is, if you were to look at those issues, and, and there are many, um, are there any that are, are, are most salient in your mind insofar as needing a, a great deal of, of immediate attention? Well, I think um, the issue of uh, one <coughs> culture continuing to be the mindset of dominating another uh, continues to prevail. You know, there are so unfortunately a constancy uh, revolving nature of acts against humankind, uh, often perpetrated by people of other cultures, <coughs> police brutality. Um, uh, we've had uh, certainly some uh, very sad headlines in the news about uh, the loss of many lives, you know, um, due to those who are, quote unquote, supposed to be keepers of the peace in our community. Um, I happen to have been working for the past 10 years uh, with a community-based organization that serves um, formerly incarcerated women in recovery. And sadly, I've met hundreds and hundreds of women who are going through the system um, and in many instances there for numbers of years and often for uh, nonviolent offenses. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of survival. Um, there are people walking the streets who've done things far worse, um, but perhaps have money for lawyers or protected in some way from having done crimes and not having to do time. And that doesn't mean that I am in support of um, uh, people committing any untoward acts, of course, but I know that some of those actions are often driven by lack of opportunity. And again, coming back to education, uh, we witness one of the greatest frauds uh, in this so-called democracy uh, by the election that took place uh, just a few months ago. And it's something that I still can't connect with. Um, we have uh, people who are <coughs> serving time um, just because of their political ideology. Uh, so we don't have access to those minds, you know, people like Mumia Abu-Jamal and many, many others. Um, I do know that um, there are not enough uh, activities that challenge the fertile minds of young people, which I think have them looking to others uh, who may have the bling bling, but nothing on the brain. You know, they may, and I, and I, and I listen to all of the music, I enjoy a lot of it, but I would like for uh, some other options to be there um, so that they could look to see, to maybe want to aspire to be like a brain surgeon or to aspire to um, take care of some of the social issues that are plaguing our communities. Uh, the housing stock now is being outpriced um, away from the ability of many people who've lived in this community. Um, one of my pet peeves is uh, the fact that we don't have uh, um, any artist housing in the community. So sometimes even if young people were, as I've heard some of these uh, students here at Wadley are actively involved in doing theater, 
Uh, they might think of theater not being a viable uh, career path, you know, because uh, it doesn't seem like something that can be money earning. Um, and I and I certainly know that Broadway and Off Broadway is full of the um, regurgitated old plays that they keep doing over and over. Why can't there be a livelihood for our expression? You know. If I can interrupt for just a second, and, and apropos of the observation that you just made, when I think of uh, of this past generation, and, and when I think of Harlem, um, I think of people like Paul Robeson, who made a conscious decision to use their art to articulate the concerns of black people. I think about um, people like Bob Marley, for example, um, or even some of the music of um, Marvin Gaye. These brothers and sisters made a conscious decision to use their art as a weapon to elevate the minds of black people. Oftentimes, when I'm listening to a lot of my brothers and sisters today, I don't hear that commitment. I don't hear that clarity. Uh, indeed, there's been an argument um, which pitted uh, certain, or a school of thought which said that art is just for art's sake. And mm -hmm. you juxtapose that with another school of thought which says that art should, in fact, be political. Uh, as an artist, as a storyteller, um, and as an actress, um, why do you think that chasm somehow has developed between many of the artists of today and, and those of Paul Robeson's generation and those who, who, who uh, reflected uh, the energy that we can find in, in a Paul Robeson? Or do you, do you even think that's important? Well, um, I also have to say in defense of a lot of the music that the young people are looking to and supporting, um, they're not being offered alternative opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and I must say, I see a very strong support system. Um, they put one another on, you know, so like the people in their camp get a <coughs> chance to, uh, to perform and record. Um, they, bu they buy houses for their grandparents. Uh, they buy houses for their mothers. Um, and there is, there is a support network within that medium. But I also have to uh, acknowledge the fact that a lot of what they're saying is a reflection of the times that we're in. And there may be messages in the music that are discomforting to the ears of some, but to a large degree, it does reflect um, some of what's going on, um, as Marvin Gaye did at the time, as Curtis Mayfield and others have done, as Bob Marley has done. You know, pardon me for interrupting again, but a good friend of mine, uh, he always admonishes not me necessarily, but those of us who somehow look at what we see happening and unfolding in front of us as being negative, he, he holds our generation responsible for that. Yes, we He are. says that we somehow, we dropped the ball and we didn't do what we had to do. If we did do what we had to do, perhaps this chasm and this little, um, this madness that we're kind of referring to would not exist. Um, mm -hmm. How can we, you know, pull this back to center? How can we give these young brothers and sisters the food that they need to, to um, go on and do what they have to do? Well, I know that, um, and I have to really um, respect the challenges um, that many teachers face, you know, um, answering that bell in the morning, especially being underpaid, that's not a reason not to serve at your ultimate best, of course, and I'm sure the majority of the teachers do. But I think a lot of education has to come from community and family. I think we have to have a greater presence of family uh, in education, uh, programs in schools, some like um, I'm currently involved in intergenerational programs through significant elders where we involve parents grandparents, the children and the teachers. So some of the the morals and the and the and the way things used to be at least are imparted to a degree and hopefully making a difference. Um, there are young people that I work with uh, that are now involved with me in uh, facilitating programs at uh, a nursing home and sometimes working with people who um, these young people might see as perhaps um, not being quote unquote all there, but I maintain that uh, there's a light bulb on sometimes, and I just wanna be there when that watt is on to receive whatever it is they have to share. And I think um, there are people that we're walking by 
up and down the streets every day who've had incredible life experiences. And many times when I'm in these senior centers in particular, I mean, I meet people, you know, who knew Cab Calloway. You know, I meet people who uh, uh, played music for uh, Catherine Dunham. You know, I meet, I, I met a man who used to be part of the Negro League. So I think programs have to uh, have an, have a kind of outreach that brings what might appear to be disparate groups together at whatever age, because this can happen with elementary, junior high school, and high school students. I think the learning has to happen outside of the classroom as well. And maybe starting to move away from, I mean, standardized tests are important, but life is more important. And I think people need to uh, be given opportunities where their common sense skills can be more developed. I think that would make a big change. You know, that's one of the things we've tried to do with the SOAR program. Uh, we'd like to get into uh, aspects of your life dealing specifically with, with, um, with art, but these young brothers and sisters are here because um, they are hungry for what you have to say, and I'm going to try and uh, restrain my, my, my impulses to, to ask you further questions and uh, give them a chance to do that. Um, but before I do, I'd like to know philosophically how do you approach your work as an artist? Um, do you have affinity for uh, Paul Robeson's perspective and uh, the perspective of, um, and I surmise that you do, but I'd like them to hear this. Uh, do you have affinity for the perspective that, uh, that uh, um, uh, a Bart Marley may have had, ha um, uh, Bart Marley had, or do you, um, or do you think that it's just a Eurocentric idea or ideal and we can just um, play with art and, and not have any, any real substance and any real meat to it? Well, I'm a vegetarian, so okay. I wouldn't have that element okay. at all. Anyway, I... Um, it's not the best metaphor. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, you know, there's so much that has been done already, a lot that has been expressed. Um, the fine art of storytelling, which is the lane that I'm in most of the time, um, makes for so many possibilities because I see stories in all kinds of experiences, family stories, community stories, the history of our community as a story, uh, the lives of children growing up, uh, adults reflecting. So uh, in terms of the art, I'm influenced by so many things, uh, music, dance, uh, the visual mediums and all of its forms and art in all of its shapes <coughs> and forms. So I don't uh, align myself, you know, to any one particular stream. Um, I work with the deaf community, so sign language becomes an art for me. I find many different forms. I'm not an artist that seeks approval and consider myself to be um, independent and sure and confident enough in myself to develop and design the kind of programs that I like to work in. And that's what I've been lucky, or I, I wouldn't say lucky, blessed with being able to do. Um, seeing a need to address um, communities that are often overlooked by arts programs is why I found myself increasingly more involved with seniors. And um, they just have so, so much to tell, you know, which is the name of one of my programs that I just relish the opportunity. And, and I'm hoping that young people will pick up on that and, and, and go to the source and, and dip into the well where this knowledge is. Um, if I were to list influences, there would be so many, um, whether they be actors, sculptors, um, because as I said, I love and enjoy all forms of art. So I'd be, I'd be hard pressed to choose any, but I certainly uh, do embrace the freedom to express. I don't think art should be censored. Um, of course, I, I would like to hope that it's tasteful and that it serves a purpose in terms of educating and um, that it should be beautiful and something that's accessible to all people that would want to partake in it. So um, as I said, I wouldn't necessarily put, uh, choose um, anyone's uh, creative philosophy, you know, to say that I embrace to uh, totally, but certainly borrow a little bit from all the greats as well as some of those emerging. I mean, I, I imitate and, and um, try to learn from young people. I watch the dances that they do. I certainly listen to their music. Uh, 
Ray J and DMX and Jay Z and all of them people. I listen to everybody because I want to know what folks are saying. You know, I, I make comparisons. I listen to the lyrics to kind of get a, a, a sense of um, uh, what's going on in their minds. You know, what they're, what, what's on the easel. You know, what that picture is going to be, how it's going to impact. Um, I study media and have for a long time. I've been involved in uh, independent uh, uh, radio for many, many years because we can uh, have a better opportunity to uh, put a real spin and turn on, on, on the things that matter to us. So it's, it's kind of really broad, you know, and I'm, and I'm always like, you know, if, if I were to use a metaphor of picking apples, just looking for the one that's ripe. Okay, thank you. We'd like to give uh, young brothers and sisters assembled here a, a chance to ask you some questions before we continue. Um, I think Naomi Naomi has raised her hand first. So would you, would you like to ask the first question, Naomi? This young lady, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is a, is a phenomenal actress, uh, uh, storyteller also. In wow. fact, she and the young lady seated behind next to Michael were um, representatives in the New York City storytelling competition oh, a couple wonderful. of years ago. And Great. she's blossomed into uh, an actress of, of some, uh, with a very unique and, and incredible voice. Good. Uh, Naomi. <coughs> um, do, you, do you think, <coughs> excuse me, do you think that young people today are discouraged to do what they want to do because of what other people might think of them? Um, I think that may have some impact, yes. But I see the young people now are a lot more daring. Uh, when I say that, uh, I, I know that uh, because of the, the, some of the challenges, I mean, if you, were, if you talk to older people, uh, particularly the, those who have um, evolved in and around the civil rights movement, um, they might say that the particular time frame in which they were coming of age and growing up into adulthood was very, very difficult because of the uh, high degree of racism. Uh, racism has just put on a different kind of hat, so it's still still here. And I'm sure you find that uh, uh, when people are job seeking or in, in other situations and just how people treat one another. But um, I think your drive and desire to do what it is you really have a passion for is, is what should be your motivation. Um, as long as it feels right in your heart and, and you're not offending anyone by it and you're certainly not doing anything that is going to bring you shame or disgrace, you know, I would say go for it. Um, if your choices is, are, are, are things that um, you may have to go into council or committee with, um, with family or even peers, you have to come out of a session like that um, feeling that you are empowered enough to make a choice that's good for you because I would think that you wouldn't want to settle for anything less than the best. Thank you. Okay. Lachey, did, did you have? Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Lachey is, is also uh, a, a young lady that um, bears watching. Yeah. Uh, she's a I have two questions. Okay. Um, all right, how do you feel about women today in our society? Do you feel that we, as women, do we set our standards and our goals high, or you know, do we discriminate ourselves? Well, I do know that um, as, I, as I look in this room and, and as I see young people as I move about, um, there is uh, now, I think more than ever, a greater uh, focus on appearance. Uh, we always look good as a people. But I see another level of care. Um, if you look at dress styles, um, I see a lot of innovation uh, in, the, in the way of appearance in terms of um, women coming in, into their own, in terms of being independent. Um, I guess if you listen to, um, I dare not forget their names, Destiny's Child or any of the music that I guess some of you may like if you're not tired of them by now. Um, are saying things about independence and having your own. And uh, I think uh, even some of the others have had songs like that um, that speak to the fact that young, young sisters want to, want to be able to, um, to pay their own way uh, to a degree. So um, I, d I don't see them maybe like taking a, a back seat 
in any way, and, and I, I want to feel that way because some of us have worked very hard, um, not necessarily to be behind or in front, and not even equal, but to be just right, you know, and to be able to have an opportunity to uh, share whatever there is and certainly not have bias visited on us because of gender. Okay, thank you. And um, my next question was, now you said that you listen to the music that we listen to nowadays and you listen, you listen to the lyrics. Mm -hmm. Now do you feel that men m mistreat women in the way they describe us in their music and songs and stuff? They put us down and stuff like, you know, stuff like that. Well, I know, I know some, some of the, a lot of the songs tend to be uh, autobiographical from experiences uh, that the artist may have had. But we have to listen to all of that music and know that um, it can't possibly represent every kind of experience and every individual and every kind of person. Um, I'm listening now to um, India Ari, mm -hmm. you know that song? Um, about video. The video. But she also has another track, uh, Faith, Courage, and Wisdom, which is a very positive song. Jill Scott. And mm -hmm. there are other artists who are um, making other kinds of statements. So there's lots of different kinds of music. and. Um, I wish, I think it was, um, there was a, a Broadway production in which um, Ruth Brown appeared, and uh, she's a, a R&B singer from uh, many years ago who is still uh, active in the arts. And she, uh, in, in, in the Broadway production, there was a song uh, that referenced a chair. The chair was used as a, as a metaphor for saying, I'll, I'll cut to the chase, something if you can't really afford to sit in it, um, you shouldn't be there. And it was still implying that um, she wanted to be in the company of someone who could take care of her. And, you know, here we are generations later, and sisters are still singing songs like that, but that's not all we're saying. Um, and those just represent a few statements. There are a lot of women doing very positive things who are achieving in education, in government. I was just watching the other day. Uh, they're uh, women achieving in sports, um, as well as men. Of course, we're not leaving you out. But certainly, um, there isn't there is an opportunity for excelling in in all kinds of ways. And 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 lyrics needn't limit us. You know, we don't have to be that which is being stated. You know, in a song, we can rise above that and shine. Thank you. We've um. We've had an occasion to talk to a number of um, brothers and sisters who sat in that very chair and have had um, much of substance to say. Um, it's been provocative, it's been informative, uh, it's challenged us. So we're pleased that we can have these kinds of conversations and that you're, you're gracious enough to be here. And while um, the next young person comes forward, I'd, I'd like to ask you, um, as a, as a Harlemite, as a Harlem resident, um, I dare say that you've witnessed some of the changes that have occurred here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it goes without saying that much of this change has been uh, the antithesis of who we are as a people. In fact, uh, I was having a conversation yesterday with a parent who was quite concerned and emphatic in her assessment of what was happening right here in Harlem and in this community. She felt that um, Columbia University was trying to take uh, this um, school and this, um, these streets and that the energy that's afoot does not bode well for us as a people unless we can rally and, and pull ourselves together to, to com combat and, and face this, this energy that's trying to, to snatch some of our soul from us. What would you say to these young brothers and sisters that likely will have to face this kind of onslaught, onslaught. Um, how can we prepare them to, to, to deal with, with what's coming? Well, certainly um, I have to place a, a tremendous amount of emphasis on education um, to be able to also participate um, as you're aspiring to higher learning, um, to learn about your community, you know, not just to live in it, um, to look at what's happening with development, to attend community meetings. Um, you, you need to be active in your block association, uh, things like um, uh, tenant councils, those kinds of meetings really tell you 
in some instances what's going on when you watch the news of things that are happening in other communities it's not too far from our doors and these have been and these things have been happening in urban areas all around the country but again um, a lot of the properties uh, that are now being a, a acquired and contested by some was available to the generation before these people uh, arrived and some of us didn't do anything about it um, and we need to be more proactive as opposed to reactive because a lot of times by the time the voices gather in unison unfortunately it's too late you know some things have been signed off on um, after what happened in the past election it's kind of hard to um, encourage young people to trust that process you know because as, as as an adult um, I don't know how to explain. I mean, I, 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 you, I know what happened, but I don't know how to um, re-spark their interest in feeling like they could be a part of that change, except to say, well, that happened, and we shouldn't throw up our hands, and we have to find some kind of um, collective power within our own ranks, you know, in the same way that you would all gather together and go to a concert to see somebody. Uh, you might have to, you know, gather together to see, well, um, like, like what can we do if we wanted to have uh, some kind of community activity or, or to arrange for speakers to come and help us to learn about things. Um, if you're hearing that uh, resources and funds are being made available for young people to learn things, well, aren't those funds part of what our parents and what taxpayers pay and what we're entitled to? Can we find out if we can have access to that so that you can have meetings about other things um, that will uh, at least offer you the hope that you will have a stake in your community? Because I don't think we should just be occupying and, and, and hopefully not feeling like one day we may only be visiting here, you know, or be on a tourist bus saying, well, you know, this used to be, you know, and I used to, you know, we certainly don't want that. We only have about five minutes remaining, but I'd like to give um, some of the brothers here uh, a chance to ask you some questions before we have to bring some closure to this, uh, this conversation this afternoon. Okay. Okay, well, well, while they're getting their thoughts <laughs> together. Okay, Heather, Heather. <laughs> Um, you were saying you listen to poetry and stuff like that oh, too. Yes. Like, what do you think the difference between like black poets and rappers? Like, what is the difference between their lyrics? Actually, not all that much because it, I mean it's writing. You know, um, I you know I don't really make a distinction. You know, and I mean there are a lot of uh, people who probably practice the form that would would lock it into some kind of definition. Uh, mm -hmm. Poets are often speaking in beautiful ways of how they describe things. Um, I, I keep referring to, I guess, some <coughs> of your music. Um, there's a, a video that I like that uh, I think is common and uh, Erica Badu. To me, that's lyrical poetry. Um, they're often, in, and what's his name? I think he's got everybody wearing these raps. Uh, music, soul mu what's his name? Soul, soul yeah. Him. Um, lyrical poetry. Um, even if, and, and even if it's about um, uh, something that we need to wake up to, you know, as some, some lyrics may strongly suggest, t to me there's not really much of a distinction. Um, recently, Sonia Sanchez and a number of other uh, poets and writers, um, I think, re-recorded uh, some of Tupac's lyrics um, and, and added their own. And some of them are now, you know, hailing him uh, for his incredible talents as a scribe and writer. So um, I don't, I don't really make a big distinction. So I, I hope that no one is um, telling you that anything that you are creatively thinking about um, doesn't uh, warrant the same kind of consideration oh, no, as someone just, who's officially a poet. Yeah. But I don't make a distinction. I just want to know because a lot of people have different objectives to that. Yeah. So, all right. Thank it's you. It's all good. <laughs> You know, I've been holding onto this paper, um, and I, I, it's, it's a, it has a thought that I wanted to share with you. Um, and as we draw to a conclusion, it's, 
It's something that Zora Neale Hurston said, and as an artist, I thought that you could respond to it and be appreciative of it. Um, and she's talking about the creative impulse and, and uh, that muse which, you know, whispers in our ear and compels us to dance and to, to write and to sing and to tell stories and, and to act and to embrace the truth. She says, the force from somewhere in space which commands you to write in the first place gives you no choice. You take up the pen when you are told and write what is commanded. There is no agony like bearing an untold story inside yourself. I dare say, in my limited knowledge of you, and from what I've heard of the young brothers and sisters here, that all of them have stories. And I would just hope and pray that they can find the wherewithal to, to tell those stories. And so in conclusion, if you will, in your own way, if you could just let us know what you would like these young brothers and sisters sitting here in Wadley, these young brothers and sisters who are trying to make their way in the world, mm -hmm. what do you, or what can you say to them that will encourage them to keep on keeping on? Well, I will uh, go from the place from where I began, and that is to say that just remember uh, that you have evolved from royalty, that you are in this universe because of the magnificence of a higher and greater being. Uh, the face that you see in the mirror is a reflection of the parts of that being who is responsible for your being here. And you have an obligation to want more, you deserve more, but you have to prepare to receive it. Um, I encourage you not to be discouraged, uh, not to let failure be your friend, and if you happen not to succeed at something that you've set out to do, check yourself and try again. That's an old adage. Um, just know that this society while it might appear on some levels to have cards stacked against you, you have the breath to blow them down. And the hand that you're dealt, you can work with it. You can exchange some of those cards so that all those kings and queens that you are will remain in your hand always. And I wish you the best as you pursue that. Thank you for coming. Bless you. And hopefully we can have you back here again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you.